Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and welcome to another True Life Story, right here with Larry Hedrick on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. A little over 70 years ago, in 1949, the infamous Peralta Stone map surfaced about 15 miles of where we're sitting right now, out near Florence Junction. There's many variations to this story, and it's not my intent to get involved in all those variations. You can go to Google and type in stone maps, and you can read all the different stories about the stone maps that you want to. But some information surfaced recently in the last few months that may lead to telling the truth about the stone maps. Needless to say, the stone maps ended up in the hands of a man named Travis Tumlinson from Texas. And there have been several people who have had personal contacts with the relatives of, of Tumlinson. Uh, you can go to Desert USA, you can go to the Treasure Net, and you can read the stories that these people who had personal contact with the relatives of Tumlinson in Texas uh, and what the relatives had to say about these stone maps. I've had a little experience with the stone maps myself. I met uh, Tom Collinborn in 1975. And it was through him, who he was teaching a class at the Apache Junction High School called Prospecting the Superstitions, that I learned what I believe is the truth about the stone maps. In 1978, Tom began talking quite a bit about the developing of a museum, and we decided to continue with that. And uh, I wanted to pull a little prank on Tom, and I also thought it would be nice to have a set of stone maps to put on display. So I made these maps in 1978. I cast them out of plaster of Paris and sand casted the bottom of them or the cross and the Don's name is on the back of the maps. And uh, put them in the trunk of the car and covered them with a blanket and went over to Tom's and got told Tom I had something uh, unusual I wanted him to see. And when he got in the proper position, I opened the trunk and yanked the blanket off and Tom's jaw dropped so far I thought it was gonna tear the bumper off my car. He was absolutely flabbergasted. He said, where did you get those? And I'd like to never convinced him that I made these maps. I also knew a fellow named Robert E. Lee. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> but um, I'm, Robert E. Lee was a filmmaker who was in a, a combat photographer in World War II and done some documentary, documentaries that was, one of them that was uh, most popular was called Sea Power. And uh, I've seen these on television years ago. But in 1971, he began to do a story on the Lost Dutchman gold mine. And uh, he finished that by 1974, but then he continued to come over here yearly at the Lost Dutchman Parade, where Tom was showing his film in the evenings after the, uh, during Lost Dutchman days. So I got to meet uh, Robert E. Lee a couple of times. And in his book, he had wonderful pictures of the maps. And it was these pictures that were very clear that I used to draw these pictures of the maps. Now my set of maps have been sitting around here for nearly 50 years now. And as far as I know, I was the first person to ever duplicate a set. Uh, one of the people that did see the set was Jim Hatt. Jim Hatt's a well-known Dutch hunter. He's passed away now. Uh, he was a trained nuclear engineer that worked at Three Mile Island, and he came out here and he worked at Palo Verde. But he, he came out here for the sole purpose of Dutch hunting, and he probably put, put as much time as anybody I know looking for the Lost Dutchman gold mine. Well, he was doing it in an old Oldsmobile Tornado car, real low, uh, off-the-ground type of a car. And... Um, he was traveling over some of the roughest roads you ever saw to get to where he uh, would start walking in to do his search. Now, my son was a mechanic and had done 
mechanic work on some other Dutch hunter's car, and he got the word, and he came over to, to have my son work on his car. And uh, he was complaining about the lowness of it and the roughness of the roads. And it just so happened I had just bought a pickup from the guy that used to own the, the old barrel root beer stand that's still here, but it's not being used. It's in the shape of a giant barrel in, in East Mesa. And his son was in Vietnam and told him to sell his pickup for him. And I bought it and Jim wanted that pickup. So I made a trade with the, for the car with Jim and a little to boot and my son fixed the car up, which had the, the front bearing was out of the it was four, it front wheel drive and the front bearing was out and uh, it was hard starting, and, but he fixed it up and sold it and we split the profit. Mm -hmm. And anyway, that red pickup that everybody saw uh, Jim driving around was the one that came from the root beer stand. <laughs> A dozen or so years after we traded vehicles and he saw my maps, uh, Jim began to make, uh, he casted copies of Match and was selling them. There was quite a few of them that were sold. I have no idea how many. And then somebody, I don't think it was Jim, but somebody come out with some miniature ones that were not much bigger than a postcard. And they were a lot of those sold. And so they're just wall hangers that people have. For example, like the one that set that... Uh, Jim gave me. The maps here have been sitting in my tack room for almost 50 years now. And other than Tom and Jim, I can't even remember who I showed them to other than that. It, that, that wasn't the point of doing it. It was, uh, it was a joke on Tom, number one. And number two, uh, we were thinking about the, we were working on the, the paperwork for the museum and I was thinking that it would be nice to have that set to put on display. Because the, you know, the, the, the mission statement of the museum was that we collect and preserve fact, fiction, and legend. So it, there's a lot of stuff up at the museum that are fact, that are fiction, and they're legend. You know, I mentioned before that there was a lot of various stories about the, the maps, uh, particularly exactly where they were found. I know of at least four places three miles apart that uh, people claim they were found. But there are people who actually went to Texas and made contact with uh, Tomlinson's relatives who are still there. And uh, they started, uh, the story in Desert USA and the Treasure Net, these stories that you can click on there and type in stone maps and you can read these stories for yourself. The most common thing about them is, is that the relatives of Travis Tomlinson told everybody exactly the same thing. There was no mix up. And one of them actually made contact with Travis's daughter who was very young at the time all this happened. And then he lost track of her because they moved and then another fella tracked her down and he made personal contact with him. So they had some pretty direct information being given to him. Now, you know, all these various stories can't all be true. But I'm here to tell you that they could all be false. Now, there's a series of pictures we're gonna show here and. I hope I can remember to get them straight and get them s sent down for editing. The first one is a picture of, well, let me back up a little bit. Travis, Travis Tomlinson uh, was, the grand, was the grandson of Pegleg Tomlinson. Pegleg was a well-known treasure hunter and so was his dad. And Travis was raised in this atmosphere of constant treasure hunting. And Peglade had quite a collection of maps, different maps of treasure hunting. And even after a fire destroyed some of them, it was still a considerable collection of maps. And the first picture we're gonna show you is a, is a long distant picture of Peglade Tumlinson's uh, house uh, and what's is dilapidated. And uh, you see the windmill there, and, and I want you to, the most thing I want you to concentrate is on the chimney. 
of this house. And the next picture we show is a close-up of the chimney. And you can see that there's carvings on this chimney, on the rocks in this chimney. And one of these carvings uh, is signed by Travis Tumlinson with the date of 1924, which meant that Travis was 14 years old when he was doing a lot of carving on Peg Lake's chimney. And um, one of the pictures here, a little further close up, is uh, of a treasure chest. It looks like you can just see one end of the treasure chest with the handle, but if you look real close, the entire chest is there, and it's a beautiful job of carving. And I got some idea how long it takes to get things like that done, and his is much bigger than, than mine. Anyway, this chimney is covered with carvings that Travis himself made. And uh, in 2016, two people that I know went down to visit the relatives down in Texas of Travis Tumlison. And they were told exactly the same thing that these other gentlemen on TreasureNet and Desert USA were told, that Travis is the one who carved the stone maps. But in 2016, one of the fellows stayed down there for a couple of months, but um, I just recently talked to, to the other one, and they didn't want their names. I'm deliberately not mentioning names. This, this isn't the point of this story. But uh, he told me that uh, they were told while they were down there in 2016, and this is the information I referred to earlier that uh, I had just learned about, and was able to verify that the witch map, and I want to say also that often it's called the priest map. I've even heard it called a banker, but it, they, the relatives referred to it as the witch map, that the model for the witch map was taken from a comic book from his daughter who was just so high. It's quite obvious from the paper map called the Peralta treasure map that this, the heart map and the map below it was copied from this piece of paper map that was in the collection of um, Peg Leg Tumlinson. But the witch map and the horse map were complete fabrications of his imagination and have absolutely nothing to do with the Lost Dutchman gold mine. And whether the paper map has anything to do with it, it cannot be proven one way or the other. Uh, but you might notice with the paper map here, compared to the stone maps, that there are some significant differences. There's information on the paper map that isn't on the stone map and was either added before, uh, after the fact, or left out deliberately on the stone maps. There's hundreds of people who absolutely believe that the stone maps are authentic. And there's probably twice as many, and I'm talking about Dutch hunters, that believe that the stone maps are completely fake. After seeing what I just showed you, you draw your own conclusion. This, uh, is this a mystery of the Superstition Mountain or is it witchcraft? Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.